welcome to you all and thanks for coming along. Um, it's really good to have you here. Welcome back to those who have already been to one or two of the sessions before or had some of these um, previously with other, other plans and welcome to all of the people who are new. Um, we hope to run a, a good session for you today. We've got um, a good panel here to discuss some of the issues. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce them um, and what I'm going to let go to each one of them one by one and let them introduce themselves. And then we'll have a quick catch up on the session and then we'll head straight into the slides. We've got a couple of interactive slides as well for you all. There's a Q&A chat which you can, which you can use. Uh, there is no chat function, it's just Q&As, and you'll have a chance to engage in some of the interactive sessions too. You can post anonymously or you can leave your name, but we won't mention names because of GDPR. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to come around to the panel. Caroline. Good afternoon, I'm Caroline Hunt. I'm a Strategy and Economy Manager in the Shared Planning Service. Hey Caroline, lovely to have you here. Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Loftus. I'm Communications and Engagements Lead for the Planning Service. Hey Hannah, nice to have you here too. Stuart. Hi, I'm Stuart Morris. I'm a principal policy planner for the Shared Planning Service. Good morning, Stuart, or good afternoon, should I say. Nice to have you here too. Um, and we've got we've got Will Smeaton and Tim Clift who are running all of our um, technical Zoom pieces in the background. So thanks to them for here being here this morning. Um, my name's Paul Freyner and I'm the assistant director for strategy and economy in the planning service so um, looking after the team who are putting this plan together so i'm going to just give you a quick overview of the session and then we'll crack straight on with caroline and who's going to bring you some of the presentation we're going to share my screen now so hopefully you should be able to see it and um, right about now and anyone please somebody shout if they can't so yeah, we've got a couple of interactive sessions to split up the hour and um, to stop us from talking at you for that hour and we're going to talk about how much to plan for, which picks up a little bit from yesterday's session um, on jobs and homes. And um, then we're going to be talking about developing a strategy. And I can see that I've put a typo in there, and I'm very sorry for that. It may be just my spelling is bad. Um, and then we'll have one of the interactive sessions. Then we'll talk a little bit about the strategy overview and go through the sites. And then we'll have a little wrap up in interactive session. And then there will be 15 minutes, around 15 minutes at the end for a focused um, panel Q&A. But I would say to you all, please ask questions all the way through. The panelists, as we're talking through the slides, will be able to answer some of those questions. Um, and we will be picking up any questions that we don't get to and picking them up afterwards in our FAQs. So I'm going to hand over to Caroline now, and who's going to start talking, pick up from yesterday's session. Caroline. OK, thank you. Um, Paul, you're quite quiet for me, but I'm hoping that um, Perhaps it's just my laptop and everyone else is able to hear you hear you properly and hopefully people can hear hear me. Um, so we're, we're talking about strategy and sites today, but to set that in context, how much development do we need to plan for? So if you came to our session yesterday about jobs and homes, um, you would have heard us talk through how we got to these numbers and that webinar will be up on our website for anyone that's particularly interested in, in that aspect of our, our first proposals. But our evidence shows that we need to plan for nearly 44 and a half thousand homes and 58 and a half thousand new jobs. But it's important to look at those in context um, with our current uh, provision for homes on the next slide, please, Paul. So we already have um, a lot of development in the pipeline from our adopted plans that were um, agreed in 2018. So we already have over 37,000 homes in our pipeline. So that gives us a need to provide for another 7,000 uh, or so. Um, but we also think it's important to plan for um, some flexibility because things don't always pan out as you think they're going to. And it's important to have a plan that is up to date um, and, and, and sound uh, and can provide a, um, a good framework for making planning decisions. So we're also proposing to include a, a buffer of around 10% flexibility. So that means we need to allocate sites for around 11,600 more homes to meet our needs in, in full. So 
that's our context for the day and how are we how have we been developing our strategy next slide please paul um and next slide again so we've identified um a guiding vision for the plan which draws very much on our consultation from the beginning of last year um, and our themes for the plan uh, which were very much endorsed through that consultation around climate change biodiversity and green spaces well-being and social inclusion and great places and they've led us to a vision um, for Greater Cambridge in 20 to 30 years time to be a place where there's a big decrease in our climate impact, but with a big increase in the quality of everyday life for our communities. And that's around reducing carbon emissions and reliance on the car um, and creating thriving neighborhoods with a variety of jobs and jobs and homes, but very much alongside nature, wildlife and green spaces and respecting our unique heritage and landscape. So we believe that's a quite a bold uh, a vision for the future. And we thought about how how do we give effect to that in our emerging plan? Next slide, please, Paul. So in developing the strategy, we published some evidence in the autumn last year which some of you may have seen, where we were looking at a number of strategic spatial options. So not site specific at this point, but in broad terms, uh, where could we focus development um, to meet those, those needs that we've identified? Um, and we looked at eight different spatial options, ranging from densification of, of Cambridge, to using land on the edge of Cambridge, but not in the green belt, which is primarily Cambridge Airport, um, edge of Cambridge in the green belt. Green belt, obviously, a really important national planning policy, but it also requires us to, as we prepare our plans, to look at the sustainability impact of our green belt. Uh, we looked at the role of new settlements might play. We looked at the role of dispersing development to villages and then some blended strategies that would focus on putting development on public transport corridors. Should we look at focusing in the southern area where there are a particular number of jobs already? Um, and what about um, a Western cluster recognizing that East West Rail is proposed to come with a new station and really make a big difference in the quality of public transport in, in that part of the, the area? So, and we also tested um, a further blended strategy around um, green belt uh, release on the edge of Cambridge too, because it's really important that we um, look at all reasonable options as part of developing our strategy. So the key aspects of our preferred strategy, um, the critical findings from our evidence related to choosing, uh, related to choosing our, our strategy were that um, location is the single biggest factor in impacts on our climate emissions. So we can do a certain amount through the way we design and build uh, our homes and community facilities and employment and so on. But where we locate sites and minimizing use of the car as uh, so it's not the first choice that makes the biggest impact on carbon. But our evidence also showed that it wouldn't be deliverable to try and focus all our development in any one broad location and deliver that through our plan period to 2041. So drawing on our aims and our evidence bases, our proposed strategy is a blended strategy so that we meet a variety of needs, um, but also to focus development at um, a range of the best performing locations for minimising trips by car. Next slide, please, Paul. So the um, key aspects of our preferred strategy, I think we skipped one, Paul. Am I just popping back one? Thank you. Oh, no, my, sorry, my apologies. Uh, so um, how, we, how have we gone about identifying the sites that go with that preferred strategy? So we um, prepared something called a housing and economic employment land um, availability assessment. And that um, is where we looked at a significant number of sites, around, a hundred, around 900 sites um, that came to us both through a call for sites that we uh, we, we, we made and also other sources of supply that we identified as being possible options for 
uh, for development and that document assessed them for their suitability, looking at a range of planning considerations, accessibility, flood risk, um, landscape impact, a whole range of uh, considerations, whether the land would be available and whether we were confident it was able to be delivered. Those sites were, uh, were assessed against our, our aims and the emerging preferred strategy following that, that initial assessment and that narrowed down the numbers to around 170, 173 sites that we tested through our sustainability appraisal process and that told us how sites perform against the three aspects of sustainability, so the environmental, economic and social aspects of sustainability. Next slide please Paul. <clears throat> so our preferred strategy uh, in our first proposals has a particular focus on densification of Cambridge um, and particularly that that's looking at northeast Cambridge in particular uh, the edge of Cambridge not Greenbelt and as I mentioned that is uh, Cambridge Airport expanding a growth area around transport nodes um, and that's particularly around Camborne uh, given the impact that East West Rail will have assuming it comes forward um, and only a limited amount of development in our villages. And I'm gonna hand back to Paul now because we'd like to hear your thoughts on the, those aspects around focusing growth. Thank you very much, Caroline. And that's a really helpful overview. And um, I think we lost Stuart for a minute, but I do think he's back now. So we've got full panel up to speed. Hey, Stuart, nice to have you back. And um, so we've, We've done these a couple of times in the previous webinars this, this week and last week, and they've been useful, and I think people have enjoyed them, and it's a time for, for people to be able to submit their own views in some senses. Um, we're using something called Mentimeter, um, and as you can see on your screen, you can either you can either download the, um, the QR code here, uh, which is on, or you can put your point your phone at the QR code and it'll come up, or you can go to this link here, um, and I actually think the number hasn't come up on this slide. It does come up on the next slide. So there is a number that you need to, to, po to put in when you get to Menti and you can, you can get to the question. So we'll run it now. I'll go to the next slide because it actually should have the, the number on there. Is, is, is that number coming up? Sorry, is it someone from the panel? Is the number coming up? Got a nod from Stuart, so that's great. So I think you can put up to sort of five, five, five words in here, but what we'd really like to ask you, I suppose, is what factors you feel we should choose to take into account when we're when we're trying to select those those sites that are to be developed and I didn't say that very well I didn't say it as well as the question came across um, and you should be able to see um, when you go to the mentee board you should actually be able to see that picture in full um, I didn't realize this until yesterday it's quite good when you look at it on your phone or when you look at it on the laptop and you can you know give us some of your thoughts about the factors that you think are really important um, when choosing you know the sites because this is obviously the underpinning part of our plan. Um, so I'm not seeing any come through yet, I'm hoping that people can get through. Um, oh, look, yeah, we've got some starts to come through now. Um, a big one is definitely transport. And obviously, as you'll know that if you've seen the, our, our, um, our Greater Cambridge Local Plan infographic tree, you can see the four themes that are really underpinned by um, you know the houses, the jobs, and the infrastructure and transport. Such a critical part of that that piece. It's not the only part of infrastructure, but certainly it is definitely something that you know we have to really consider in our strategy. And um, see if any others come through at the moment. I wonder if people are having problems with the Minty board. Well, I think the the, the QR code on the previous slide. I think it was wrong, but I think if people go to the website address and put in the number then that should work. Okay, my apologies. Yeah, so if the, the number's showing now, um, just use the website and the number. Um, apologies if that was the wrong code. Um, bear with us with the new the new tech that we're using. We are trying to mix it up a little bit. This is still a little bit new to us. So lots, lots coming through now, which is great. Um, yeah, lowest flood crisis. And obviously, yeah, how I mentioned, in I think a couple of previous slides ago, you know, a lot of our strategy, you know, all of our strategy will need to be tested against in the sustainability appraisal or against those environmental, um, economic and social factors that make up the sustainability appraisal. So yes, all of these things are uh, uh, hugely important. And something around wild space here, you, you know, and we have got a reasonably comprehensive, I say reasonably, I'm doing it injustice. 
comprehensive green infrastructure study and, and actually the session um, I think in two weeks time the last of our, our webinar sessions goes into quite a lot of detail around the green infrastructure we've got Stuart here Stuart's led quite a lot of the work Stuart is there anything that, any thoughts or comments that you want to say about how that's come into your thoughts over developing the strategy um well I just I guess a, a taster of one of the next slides is but yeah it's been a key component of considering uh both where development should go but also where new green infrastructure and nature sites might go um and so that's been entirely developed in parallel alongside considering sites of development you might remember we did a call for green space sites so it definitely is a priority in um, a few slides time we'll show you the kind of overview of where we've got to with that work yeah absolutely and you know there's lots of good answers on here and these are you know definitely all things that we, we're constantly thinking about and have been really a core part of developing that strategy so, so quite detailed and in-depth process um, but you know we have, have committed to build on the themes that we started to plan with and you know, you know you're picking up on quite a lot of those things as it is um, so we do, are taking a lot of this away as well feeding it into the consultation but obviously you know part of these webinars is really to get you know to give you a, a feel for how we put the plan together but allow you to you know to understand how best to comment and how best to get involved and put those detailed comments into the consultation and you know we will you know, we'll remind you how to get involved and participate in either um, either the um, short survey we've got a very short survey that you can get involved in and, and do anonymously or actually you know if you want to put in longer comments and much more detailed comments you know there is capacity for that and we do welcome those you know with good rationale about some of these things we have got another quick mentee to do I think just before um, just before we go to the, the next session Stuart was talking about and you've seen this slide previously Caroline mentioned it and this is um, you know this is the site that we were looking at this is uh, these are the eight sites that we the, the eight types of strategies that we looked at um, and what we want to do now really quickly is from our own perspective is rank your own preferences on those sites and just to for us to get a feel how you all see this site. I know we've only got 40 people here today I'm hoping that we will be able to you know, share this um, webinar much more widely um, and maybe get some other views back and um, so it'd be good to see you know some of those rankings and how we've how we've we've come about it and um, just to remind you all of them so there was the and, and I think you can probably see that slide of the strategy options much more clearly in the Mentimeter than you can on, on, the, on the screen slide share but they are densification of Cambridge urban area focusing on those public transport corridors again so an edge of Cambridge not in the green belt dispersal to villages new settlements um, an edge of Cambridge in the green belt um, so you're starting to see those come through now and um, and yeah I mean it's it's a uh, it's a clear favor oh, actually yeah, we've taken over on public transport corridor corridors now so you know that focus on densification and public transport is is obviously very important because of the sustainability piece any thoughts on that from the panel starting to see those changes I do like these actually it's interesting to see people's views I guess one thought is I think one of the points Caroline raised was that one of the critical evidence findings was that it wasn't deliverable to put uh, all the development in any one of these places which is where we've ended up with a blended strategy and in terms of sustainability certainly densification and focusing on the Cambridge urban area came out top particularly in terms of transport so if there was all the space in the world that probably be where you would end up um, but noting that key constraint of well there isn't clearly and isn't enough uh, land there to, to do that that's that's where you end up looking to other places another point interesting i'm sure we've got green belt down the bottom i remember from the first conversation that was a controversial one it was both very it had quite a lot of support from from uh, some groups but also came up with quite a lot of negatives as well so it was kind of polarized views um which probably re reflects the uh, the sensitivity of the, the issue around um edge of cambridge green belt yeah, absolutely, Stuart. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, lots of polarising conversations within planning, but that is absolutely one of them. And the other thing that I would note around, certainly around that densification, which is from a tran transport piece, is that, you know, from some of the climate work we're doing around reaching zero carbon, which we have got another session on that next week, a full session on, on that, that piece, you know, again, those those two are coming out much, much more strongly in terms of the strategy and, you know, underpins our our commitment really to to ensuring that this is a sustainable plan and delivers on that zero our, our, um, 
aspirations as well. Is there any other thoughts before we move on to the rest of the slides from the panel? Yeah, Caroline. the other thing I was going to just highlight is that our transport evidence said that most of these options you, you could deliver in, in, in some shape or form, but they have very different um, performances in terms of the amount of trips that would be made by, um, by non-car modes. Um, but the one option they said was wouldn't be possible to deliver all our needs would be dispersal to villages um, because it just really wouldn't work in transport terms. So that was quite interesting. So we, you know, we have looked carefully at where villages may be able to play a role where they have that very good public transport, which is the one that's come up ranked first on, on, on the list here. Um, but generally dispersal to villages isn't an option for all our development and really isn't, you know, isn't a sustainable um, way to meet need. Absolutely, Caroline, thanks for that. Okay, that's really useful. It's really nice to see some of these thoughts coming through from you as well and, and break it up a bit. So thank you for that. Um, so moving on, um, now um, I, think, I think I'm handing over to Stuart. Is that correct? He's gonna do the strategy overview? Fantastic, Stuart, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Paul. So Caroline's talked about how we developed the strategy and this just provide an overview of the strategy before moving to the sites. So some kind of key points to bear in mind. So drawing on what Caroline said about the uh, strategic options, the new sites we've selected in line with the aim of locating sites where they minimise trips by car um, and thereby carbon emissions. Key point to note, I guess, is also that uh, with the location of sites, but there's also the scale of sites that we included. So the, the site, uh, our focus of development has been on large sites, which are capable of um, having both jobs and homes and services, which in itself uh, then minimises the trips that need to be made outside of the area, uh, outside of the site, and also by car. Um, so that's uh, one to bear in mind. We did also allocate sites for particular employment needs in the locations that, that met those specific, specific needs. Um, and we'll touch on those when we get to the sites point. Drawing on the carbon, um, only 4% of the homes, it says they will be in the villages. Um, and so that is uh, quite a small percentage. I think it's around three or 400 homes in total over the plan period. So it is, it is a very small percentage of the overall distribution of development. And that again, kind of flows from what Caroline was saying in terms of, uh, in terms of carbon terms, locating homes and villages is the least sustainable thing that we could be doing. So we have erred away from that in this plan. Previous plans, you may remember, uh, have included brand new settlements such as North Stowe, Water Beach, Bourne Airfield. Uh, and this plan marks a, a change from that um, in terms of um, there's the opportunity now at North East Cambridge, Cambridge East to locate development, particularly on the edge of um, and in Cambridge, um, and then expanding the existing new settlement of Camborne rather than identify a whole brand new uh, settlement noting particularly that Camborne has the benefit of the East West Rail Station that's coming. As Paul and I referred to, green infrastructure is key and it is a priority in the plan as one of our big seven themes, and I'll touch on uh, the details of that uh, later on. Um, but obviously where you put development and, and how you form that development has an impact in terms of minimising the additional land take from that development to provide more space for green infrastructure. One of the questions people have uh, put in the chat I can see is, well, what about that water constraint? Um, it's very been a, a big issue in the news and the first proposals plan uh, puts it front and centre. We're not uh, hiding this fact at all. It's, it's really very clear in the plan that the delivery of the sites and the proposals that we've put forward are uh, entirely contingent on that water supply being adequate without causing further environmental harm. And we had a, a whole slide on this in the, the last webinar. So the current evidence suggests that the planned reservoirs and improvements that we need to supply will be delivered quite late in the plan period to meet our preferred trajectory for sites. Um, interim measures are being explored and uh, a significant amount of work um, by the water um, companies along with environment agency and partners to uh, look at what can be done and to do that as fast as possible. But if we don't have enough certainty about water supply, we will need to do something about that and review what our proposals are in terms of the phasing of uh, sites. Um, so we will need to keep this under review and we're, we're very aware that this is a headline point for the plan. Next slide, please. So 
this uh, diagram particularly shows you in terms of housing, uh, the distribution of uh, sites proposed. Starting with the red blobs, you recognise North Stone, Water Beach, and those are um, our housing delivery studies suggest that more homes could be uh, delivered there faster. So this is not new, new sites, it's not uh, any additional uh, homes, it's just homes coming faster. Um, our evidence shows that they can be delivered uh, faster by 2041, and that can make some of the uh, gap needed to fill from our objectively assessed need for homes that Caroline identified. Secondly, the turquoise blob at Eddington. So um, the uh, developers, and we've uh, reviewed this, we think there could be space for additional homes on the, addition, on the existing allocated site there. So there's no expansion of the uh, built footprint, um, but that more homes could be delivered there, about a thousand homes perhaps by the end of the plan period. You can also the orange, see the orange blobs, there's clearly a, a lot of sites continuing to be built out, which were identified in previous plans, particularly on the edge of Cambridge and then Campbell West and Bourne Airfield. And then in terms of the purple, the proposed new site allocations to meet our need, the uh, key big sites really in northeast Cambridge, you can see there. So 3,900 homes by the end of the plan period, um, but uh, significantly more than that um, by uh, the time the, the development is built out. Uh, Cambridge East, um, again, about 3,000 by the end of the plan period, but uh, with, we're seeing that perhaps 7,000 homes and 9,000 jobs could come there, forward there. Again, in terms of uh, employment, a key other site of note is we're thinking that there could be the potential for limited release of Greenbelt on the edge of Cambridge at Cambridge Biomedical Campus to support continued development uh, growth there of the campus. And then the other big location you may be aware of is at Camborne. Um, which we're just identifying as a broad location for growth and no specific sites right now. But we see that uh, perhaps 2,000 homes might be delivered there and jobs too. Um, we're still working on uh, firm plans for what that might look like in the longer term. Thanks, Paul. So I guess just to talk about the, the distribution and, and the supply, what does this all mean? So um, Caroline identified there's about 11,000, 11,500 homes needed to be delivered over our current supply. In the first column, you can see that current supply is very significant in terms of the homes we've already got planned, so about 37,000 homes. That faster build out at North Stowe and uh, Water Beach gets you about 1,500 homes and 1,000 at Eddington, which then uh, results in about 9,000 homes that we're identifying through new allocations. And you can see that split there between the different broad locations. So 4,000 around the Cambridge urban area, about 3,000 on the edge of Cambridge, uh, about 2,000 uh, new settlements, that's for Camborne, and then those three to 400 in the villages, so a really small number. And you can see at the bottom there, so, so having sifted through all the sites in the uh, housing and employment land availability assessment um, and considered the right strategy, we've identified only 19 sites out of about 900 first identified through the Cork sites and other sources of supply. Thanks, Paul. So I've trailed green infrastructure about three times already. Here's the plan of what we're proposing. Um, and we did a, a detailed evidence base uh, working with our consultants and uh, various partners and local groups to identify what's already there in terms of green and blue infrastructure being the water environment. And we've come up with these uh, areas, um, which so site specific or kind of area specific ones, so the uh, ones that you can see there on the map, and then a further five um, of kind of dispersed initiatives. Um, and these, the areas of the area specific ones tie in with the proposals by uh, Wildlife Trust, Cambridge Past, Present and Future in terms of the uh, Cambridge Nature Network. They also tie in with the local nature partnerships areas. Um, but we've also particularly had an eye to where new development might go and how does that tie in. So, for example, you can see uh, number six, the kind of amorphous monster blob north of Cambridge um, is the proposed North Cambridge Green Space, which is to provide um, uh, some nature areas, but also uh, accessible sites for people uh, close to North Stowe, Water Beach, North East Cambridge, and to relieve pressure on uh, designated nature sites further away. Thanks, Paul.
So I think if I'm right and I'm correct in my running order, and thank you, Stuart, for that really comprehensive overview of the strategy there. Um, I think it's Hannah up now, and I think you're going to be talking us through the science. Is that right, Hannah? Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, do you start us off? So, um, we're not going to talk through every single site, but just so that people have an overview by area of which sites um, we're looking at in the first proposals and what the kind of overall vision is and how they fit into some of those strategic uh, questions that Stuart and Caroline have touched on. I'm going to focus here on the proposed new site allocations, um, but all of these maps are on our website. You can also go onto the interactive map as well, which is really, really useful. Brings up lots of different information about both the proposed new sites and the existing site allocations that we're carrying forward from previous plans. So if I'm not going through every site in detail and you want to know more, please, please do go on there and see. So the Cambridge urban area already, as you can see, has quite a lot of orange sites. Those are the ones that we are carrying forward from the previous plans. And there are a range of scales from the kind of finishing of Orchard Park as a project that was a, a kind of really significant extension to the city um, in previous plans um, through to smaller sites. This time round, we've got the major urban site is, of course, Northeast Cambridge, which um, many of you will know a lot about already because we've been developing an area action plan for that for some time now. Um, that's obviously a key brownfield site, has a really great public transport connection. So it really takes a lot of those boxes around minimizing car use, really lowering our carbon emissions um, and, and making best use of previously developed land, brownfield land, rather than having to send development kind of sprawling out into the rural areas or the green belt. So that's a, that's a key one. Then there's also a couple of uh, smaller sites. Um, there's some land south of Coldham's Lane. So we already identified an area of major change around this area. Um, and there's now a, a specific site allocation that we're proposing in there. And then there's a very small site, almost impossible to pick out on this map, but it is the garages between St Matthew's Street and the Blue Moon Pub in Cambridge. And that's a small housing site there. But I think it is worth pointing out on this map that there are these other opportunity areas because, of course, the city is a place of regeneration and reuse of land as well. So the opportunity areas and the areas of major change really are us saying, here are some locations where we see different forces at play over the next 20 years, 20, 30 years, and the opportunity for um, redevelopment in a coordinated and comprehensive fashion to come forward here and we think we should put some policy guidance in place so that when those owners on those sites and those those developers look at them they're not just doing piecemeal development they're actually adding up something that's really significant that makes a big difference to how those sites work so whether it's along mill road whether it's down near the station um, whether it's you know some of the the retail parks and so forth where we know that retail habits are going to be changing a lot we want to see those, um, when they do come forward, developed in line with a vision that we are setting with some aspirations that we are setting here. If you could go to the next slide. Um, so, oh, I think we've missed that. We missed a sort of like little vision illustration for the, the urban area of Cambridge, but we have a set of these illustrations that are on our website as well, that just talk about in kind of conceptual terms really, but a bit more visually what we're looking at. So the edge of Cambridge, again, really interesting here. Um, and how do we create development that is um, of a significant enough kind of density and scale to create real new neighborhoods here, but um, also mediates that junction to the countryside, provides a really good edge to the green space and green belt beyond and make the most of those links that Stuart was talking about. How do we actually link out to the countryside to our amazing natural spaces and make them part of the placemaking vision? So if I could have the next one. Clearly the really big one here, is, as most people are aware, is of course Cambridge East. So 
there's been some development on the fringes of the Marshes Airport site, Marley and, and land north of Cherry Hinton that was already identified. But Cambridge East is somewhere where we now have confidence that that will come forward in the plan period and we can start really putting in place a robust policy framework for what kind of new neighbourhoods that's going to create over this 20 to 30 year time horizon. It's really worth stressing for those big sites like Cambridge East and North East Cambridge, that they, they'll deliver some numbers in this plan period, but they'll keep delivering over the plan period and, and beyond. So the numbers that you may see in the policies, because we have to show the numbers from 2020 to 2041, are potentially just some of the total amount of development that could come forward, um, because they take a really long time. If you look at Northstone and Water Beach Newtown as examples from previous plans, you know, they're still building out through this plan period, probably even slightly beyond this plan period in some cases. The other significant site on the edge of Cambridge that's new is looking at the biomedical campus area. So you can see a kind of small purple uh, polygon there next to the existing site allocations that were identified in the adopted plans. And then you can also see a black line around that, which is us saying we think that we need a wider policy framework to ensure that we protect and enhance the landscape around the biomedical campus. It is not just about the development, but it's also ensuring that that comes with a really comprehensive landscape strategy. So we're looking at potential allocation there. And again, really welcome views on this from the consultation. We want to know what people think should happen around the biomedical campus, how we can support it, both in terms of its vital contribution to healthcare and life sciences, but also in terms of potential affordable housing or key worker housing in that area. Next one, please. In terms of our new towns, we've got um, three of them. We've got North Snow, Water Beach, and of course, Camborne. So those are, again, sort of starting to grow up into real places. Camborne's obviously been around for a while and that's really the focus this time around. North Stone Water Beach, I think everybody's quite aware of what's going on, but how do we look at Camborne now that East West Rail is coming along? And if I could have the next slide. So at North Stone Water Beach, there's no actual change to the, to, to the consented plans that are proposed. It is simply about trying to speed up delivery there. So they really do reach a kind of critical mass and a really vibrant community um, slightly quicker. But at Camborne, as you can see, we have a, a mysterious circle at Camborne because we haven't identified any specific sites, but we're really aware that with East West Rail coming along, it will suddenly become one of the best, like, best connected places in the area, um, relatively late in the plan period, but definitely in the plan period, we think. So again, this is an open question as part of the consultation where we've said, we think it's a good broad location to potentially focus development because it will have such fantastic public transport links um, and because it already has some quite good community facilities and the potential for more and so forth. We would really love to hear what you think about how Camborne could grow from a village into a town as it is now and into a really vibrant uh, community going forward. What are the ingredients that would make that really tick? Um, and any thoughts about where geographically or in and around Camborne that should be focused? Uh, next one. So Southern Rural Cluster, um, this is a really interesting one, which we decided to separate out into its own kind of subsection in the plan, really because of this co-location that Stuart and Caroline mentioned between jobs and homes. We know there are these really important uh, jobs, clusters, Abraham and so forth in this area, um, and also pretty good public transport links in terms of the Petra train line coming down to the south, which stops some of the villages there. So whilst we're not looking at enormous amounts of development, we think there's a case to be made for just helping the sustainability of those communities and, and providing some homes in close proximity to jobs and to that public transport. So if you could go to the next one. So um, there are a few proposals here that you can see outlined. Um, there's the... Uh, 
potential land between, oh, actually, I just noticed that should be purple and it's not as orange on that map, so apologies, we'll get that corrected. There's the land between uh, Hinton Way and Mibble Lane in Great Shelford. So that is a relatively small site um, and it's relatively well, very close, in fact, to the station, as you can see there. So we feel that there's a case to be made for using that site that's been proposed um, and, and bringing that forward. Um, and then you can also see that there's some other existing uh, sites that would be carried forward and so forth. But then I think, I'm afraid, I think some of these colours have gone slightly off, haven't they, Stuart? Because I'm pretty sure that the Duxford site is a new one. Um, and uh, also the Comfort Cafe one is a new one, isn't it? Or have I got that wrong? No, good. I'm remembering. It's quite hard to remember all the sites in detail. You can also see those, those are two small sites, as you can see. You can also see that we've decided to, add a, to, to suggest a policy area at the genome campus, and that is quite significant because, as many of you will know, there's a site there that now actually has permission for new homes, actually quite a substantial number of new homes there. And that's come forward outside of um, the, it wasn't an allocation in the previous local plan, it's come forward in the kind of interim and very much linked to welcome genome campuses continued success and expansion. So we want to ensure that whilst we're not needing to allocate more sites there for new homes because there's already permissions in place, we continue to control the direction of travel at the genome campus through some strong policy frameworks there as well. Uh, next one. Um, and finally, into the rest of the rural area, um, not very, uh, again, not very much development proposed here for all of the reasons that Stuart and Caroline set out. From a transport and a carbon perspective, it was really clear from our evidence work that most rural sites performed poorly. They were going to really contribute to increased carbon emissions, increased congestion on our roads, um, and, and there weren't enough other factors that would mitigate or balance out against so we've got a couple of, uh, of, of, a few, very few sites, if you could go to the next slide here, but these are really about focusing on the most sustainable locations, a little bit of rural employment land, because that is really important, um, and things like that. So I'll just run through them quickly. Firstly, there's a couple of small sites in Melbourne. Melbourne, of course, is one of those villages that has good public transport connections, and that's absolutely key. Um, so we feel it's worth supporting the sustainability of Melbourne as a community with those two small sites. Um, there's a site at Highfields Caldercott. Now that's a sort of interesting one because that's essentially part of a larger site that came through, in fact, it's a five-year housing land supply site. So we had that site came along and it and it felt to us that actually now that was on the table and was coming forward, that kind of completing that made sense um, in terms of its, its overall sustainability. Um, then you can see there's a couple of uh, employment sites, um, land near the A14 services and at Buckingsway Business Park. Um, then there's also um, a, a, a small site in Oakington and Mansell Farm, very small site, very near Northstone in terms of the new town, so almost kind of adjoining that. Um, and then there is a proposed policy area looking at east of the bypass in Longstanton. That's a really kind of interesting site. And again, it's somewhere where we feel we want to provide proactive policy direction, not just um, wait and see what happens, but actually provide some proactive direction there as well. And again, as I said, all of these sites are on our interactive map, so you can very much have a look and see what's going on there. But you can see how few sites are now being suggested in the rural area. Um, and, and that really is that focus on transport, sustainability, um, and really making the best use of land, compact development where possible. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and that's a comprehensive run through the sites. And as, as Hannah mentioned, you know, a lot of those graphics and maps are available um, to our website as well. So happy for you to delve into those. Um, as you formulate your responses to the consultation. So we're, we're, um, we've got another couple of very short interactive sessions just to get a few more views from you guys before we carry on with the full panel session at the end for the last 10 minutes or so. But as I say, there's lots of, lots of questions coming through. We're trying to answer them in the panel. We'll, we'll pick up those that don't get answered um, today. 
to try and keep them focused on the session that we have today, which is around the strategy. Uh, if there are other questions on some of the other issues, we're going to bring you along to some of our other sessions too. Um, in terms of this next interactive session, oh, I'm going to move back one. So just we'd like to think what you think of it. Um, I mean, you've heard from you've heard from the team, you've heard from, from the panel, um, and even for those of you who haven't had a chance to have a look at it yet, um, it's the same entity that you can use the same code for this. But, you know, we, we do welcome your views and we have tried to kind of every time we've gone out to consult and every time that we've taken, you know, a new step in this this journey, um, you know, we've tried to kind of reiterate and take views into consideration, you know, where that's a, that's possible. And we do really value what people think. Um, and I think, you know, we'd like to, you know, see what you think about strategy. I mean, a lot of work has gone into it. This is a really significant area to be doing plan making in. And it's also a really significant time to be making plans in. You know, we have all of us, you know, pretty much been through, you know, a, you know, a once in a, you know, once in a century um, kind of, you know, issue in terms of COVID. But at the same time, we, we're struggling with some of the, you know, the com most complicated kind of challenges, you know, most of people have faced, and you know, around climate change, lots of issues around social inequality. So we've tried to really think about how we set out a framework and a strategy that can help us you know start solving some of those problems or start moving towards solutions of some of those problems um, in the next 15 to 20 years we know that plan making is incredibly uncertain everything's uncertain but we have to we have to do this it's just you know it's, it's incumbent upon us to at least you know use the best information we currently have to set out you know how we feel we can achieve some of the things that we're looking to achieve um and yeah i think that you know there's going to be lots of there's lots of lots of comments coming through it's disproportionate i mean i'm interested to understand understand a little bit more about that i mean i feel like we've probably made quite a proportionate um strategy really because we have balanced it off against all of the strategy options we looked at and we did take quite a lot of those too um you know i'm glad that people are thinking it's interesting um real concern on what could be lost um, I think that's interesting I mean you know everybody knows that planning's a lot about trade-offs and, and you know they are and planning plan making is underpinned by you know those sustainability pays that were mentioned um, mentioned earlier in the session and as, as we've said before there's another session specifically on some of the environmental issues which is next week but what we have really tried to do is we've tried to ensure that actually this plan embeds you know positive you know environmental improvement at every opportunity um as wherever possible really and you know we do you know i think without a plan you know we are a plan led society you know in the uk we are plan led that's the way we do development and without it you know development jobs homes will happen with it with or without us and and what we try and do is really try and put a framework around that so it is sustainable are there any things that's standing out for you guys on the panel here of some of the comments you know you've had such a lot of involvement in developing the strategy you know some nice comments there too i think it's interesting to see sort of that that about that uh a split between um kind of people liking the idea of like things like faster build out and, and attracting people to come, come here um and also worrying about the commuting patterns and so forth um interesting questions around the north of the city as well um and, and I think, you know, the AAP, the, the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan obviously gives a lot more detail on kind of what the vision is for that site and how we hope to achieve that. And I think if you're interested in that subject, because we are going to be having a special webinar, it's very much focused on the North East of Cambridge and so forth. I just really encourage you to come along to that. I believe it's the 25th of November. So um, do kind of have a look and, and see at that. Um, but, you know, it's ambitious and I think I see, I see sort of ambitious interesting there as well. And we're at a really early stage here. So this sort of feedback is really fantastic because what we're hoping you'll tell us is where should we kind of go next with some of this stuff? How can we deliver on some of those interesting or ambitious things and maybe, you know, avoid some of the fears and the, the worries about development that are also being expressed? These are not fully formed policies yet. We don't have all of the detail on, on the site specific policies that we will have later on. So now is the time to kind of tell us 
what really would make um, a, a good policy on a specific site using your local knowledge as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, and I think that the one thing to point out, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to the next Menti session um, so people can start feeding into that. And then I'll start pulling off the questions too, so we can hopefully double up a little bit here. So um, yeah, really good to see some of those thoughts coming through. Um, the next one, the next Menti session, I think we've got one of some people in there already. What would make these sites into great bases, bases again? Um, so, you know, please put your your thoughts into this um, this board as well, because as, as Hannah's mentioned, yeah, it's really important that you know we gather them at this stage of plan making. And um, you know some of the things around population and growth, it's a really it's a really difficult one, and we do understand how divisive it can be. But a local plan isn't looking at just today; it's looking at the future, and not just the people who live here today. We, they are very important. Our communities are hugely important, but you know we are also planning for people who are currently in primary school. We are playing for people who haven't even been born yet and actually that's a really difficult job to do so we need to take you know the opportunity to say actually you know population growth the way that humans migrate human geography changes and happens with or without planning planning was put in place to have some development framework around that and actually you know this is a really important part of doing it and the one thing that you know you know also comes to mind is we do reiterate these plans regularly the, the plans are reiterated on a five-year basis at absolute minimum and there may be you know, a view that actually that's not regularly enough in you know very swift moving and accelerated um 21st century but it's um it's certainly something you know there are challenges and we know that um but there's lots of good stuff coming through and i think you know please shout out panelists on some of those comments but what i'm going to do is i'm going to answer a few questions off now there's a couple of questions on sewage and water supply and i know that stuart's already mentioned them quickly but we will touch upon them because they are a core theme and um, there is a session next week um, which goes into more detail. But do you want to pick up those questions quickly, um, Caroline or, or Stuart, one of the two of you? You're quite close, um, close to that issue. I think Stuart was going to respond to that. Sorry about the sewage, Paul. Yeah, sewage and the water, I think just a touching on the, the um, integrated water assessment, I suppose, really. Yeah, I guess it was well, just the broader note that um, so the integrated water assessment does identify that the current um, uh, sewage plant at, at, um, in North East Cambridge does need improving um, to address planned and future growth. So it's just the point, I guess, that doing nothing is not an option uh, at that site. Um, I don't know if Caroline wanted to talk more uh, specifically about the, the Anglin water relocation at all, but that, that's a broader point. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm trying to try out some of these questions with some of the stuff that's coming through again. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff around community patterns. And, and you know, I think that, that nobody really has the, the true answer to this. We've, we've got a, some interesting conversations coming through yesterday around COVID and the impacts of COVID on, you know, movement and people's movement from remote working. But we're only, what, 18 months into that. So, you know, we have to keep an eye on it. We will be doing some further economic work next uh, over the next few months to, to inform the next stage of the plan but we have to work on trends that may stick or may not stick and there may well be future things that will really change the way that people move we need to be really cognizant of that and um, you know flexible policies in some ways are a really you know really great thing and we'd love to be able to do more around that and you know some of the work that we have to do you know we'll need to challenge that too um let me see let's have a look should the plan clarify there is also an important existing employment cluster at North East Cambridge not relying on the AAP? Um, I wonder how, Hannah, I don't know if you, you're very cited on the AAP or Caroline actually, because yeah, you, you, you're quite cited on the AAP. You might be able to talk about that question. Yeah, I mean, we have a number of um, existing quite large employment um, centres in and around um, Cambridge. Uh, the, the Cambridge Science Park and the St John's Innovation Centre and so on in that northeast part of Cambridge are obviously, um, you know, obviously very important locations for for employment, um, as are many others. West Cambridge, the biomedical campus, Grant Park, um, the Genome Campus, Babraham Research Park and so on. So, so that, you know, this area is has has a lot of very um, um, successful economic um, locations but certainly North East Cambridge is one of those 
uh, but one of the benefits that the Northeast Cambridge development can bring is to provide more homes closer, you know, close to those jobs um, and enable more trips to be made locally. But it is, um, I think was said, the, the most sustainable location that came out from our transport modelling because it has such good public transport um, uh, connectivity already with the station, the busway, um, a new links up to water breach coming, cycling, uh, you know, it, it, it really is a very accessible location for development. That's one of the reasons it, it, it comes out so favorably um, in, in, in our evidence and in our studies. Thanks, Caroline. I've got a question around Camborne here, here and, and I'm gonna to come to Hannah for that one. I think Camborne looks like a massive housing estate now, apart from potential transport into these West Road, just can't see leisure facilities meeting needs in future as Cambridge is the place to go for this. Who will want to live there apart from cheaper housing costs compared to Cambridge? Um, Hannah. Yeah, super interesting um, about Camborne and actually somewhere where we, we have been focusing some of our engagement activity to try and understand more about the community who already live in Camborne and what their aspirations are for the future. Um, and we've been doing some workshops with young people um, in, in Camborne and it's really interesting how much demand you know, they have for, for better facilities in Camborne. Um, and a few really lovely kind of sound bites and things that came out of that. I mean, people say, well, actually, why isn't Camborne like the, new, the next Cambridge? You know, take the best bits of Cambridge and you know, maybe East West Rail could deliver that in Camborne. Um, so it will be interesting to see how that critical mass of, of, of uh, people as both the existing communities um, and the new, the new areas where, where the ones that are already coming on stream, like West Camborne um, and indeed Bourne Airfield to the other side, um, how those start to mature. But I think the community representatives that we've spoken to in Camborne so far, and we are having some more events there um, coming up in the consultation period, have really expressed um, some op optimism about seizing the opportunity of East West Rail to create much more business opportunities, much more leisure opportunities, um, allowing people to actually start more businesses in Campbell. And there's a lot of people who'd like to start their own businesses and there's just no space for them there. So there's a lot of really interesting things coming out there. Um, and also what people value about Campbell as a location that it has got a slightly slower pace of life. People really value the links into the countryside. And so some things there that we're gonna to have to be careful not to lose alongside all the gains that could come Thanks, Hannah. I'm going to come to another question here about employment sites, and I wonder um, if Caroline um, or potentially Stuart can talk to this. Are, are employment sites focused in the north, like the homes? Uh, so Christian, what I'm going to do whilst that's being answered, I'm going to move my screen on from the mentee now to bring up the rest of the sessions and the, um, the, the links to how you can get involved more fully and get your thoughts in. So uh, who's picking, picking up this employment question, please? Well, as I just mentioned, you know, we have um, uh, a number of um, significant clusters of employment um, uh, around Greater Cambridge. Uh, there are significant employment opportunities in the north uh, with more to more to come through places like, you know, North Stone, Water Beach, as well as um, more in northeast Cambridge area. Uh, there are clearly significant employment um, parks in, in the south and you saw through the spatial options that we looked at that we did look at whether there were um, opportunities in the, the south around, around those employment locations. Um, so, you know, but we, we have looked carefully to try and make sure that we are only putting development in locations where people don't need to use their car every day for movement because that is such a significant part of, um, you know, need for to be a focus of our strategy, given that real focus on, on, on climate change, which is, you know, an ever increasing issue for us. You know, we've always aimed to reduce travel, but it's now, you know, it's now crucial for the planet, let alone for us in, in, in this area. Um, I mean, our transport evidence did look very carefully at a range of, uh, of different locations and, and how development in those different locations would perform. It looked at the, uh, the way that we might choose to travel in those different locations. So 
you know, the percentage of trips that would be by car, the percentage of trips by public transport and by active means by, you know, on your foot, on, on, on foot or, or using a cycle. Um, and and, and it, it really did point us very clearly to the, you know, the most sustainable locations being in and on the edge of Cambridge. Um, and, uh, and, and Campbell came, you know, very, very close behind, behind that. So when you bring that all together, that, that has very much informed the strategy that we, we put together here. But Thanks obviously interested to hear your views. That's what this is all about. And I think it's important perhaps to say that this is an extra stage in plan making this time. We haven't gone straight from that early consultation through to a draft plan we we're having this conversation with you now around the preferred option so that we've got the opportunity to hear views and to if we need to we we've still got the opportunity to adapt our strategy and our policies before we actually write up that full draft plan so we you know we are genuinely keen to hear from as many people as possible uh, as we go through this consultation Thanks very much, Caroline. And, and you know, I'm, I'm aware that we're a couple of minutes over time. If panelists do want to pick up any questions while I just talk through this last little bit, I'm absolutely happy to. But as you can see on my screen now, we are, you know, this is one of the series of, of webinars. Um, we've, we've had five, uh, we've had two already. One is around how to engage with the plan, but, but um, substantive ones around development numbers. This is around science, science and spatial strategy. And you know, the theme is, and we understand the theme that we, you know, we, we, we've, we've been here working on this plan for you know, best part of two years. We understand that there's, you know, there are concerns around the environmental issues, around climate, um, around biodiversity, around the water. And that's why we've, you know, we've got two specific sessions on those coming up. So, you know, we will be able to talk a little bit more in detail of those. And we have got some of our consultants joining us. So you'll be able to ask some of those questions. You know, we haven't hidden away from anything, really. We have been very, very open in how we go about, you know, bringing this to the forefront because we are, you, we want to solve these problems or work towards solving these problems as well. It's part of, you know, we're a team of planners, you know, our, part of our world is really trying to make places better um, in all aspects. And um, so please do join us for those. I expect to see them as being really, really busy sessions. And um, I might have even grow my beer back a little bit by the time we get to the end of the month. And we do have one specifically on Northeast Cambridge and the local plan and the area action plan. I know there's a few questions coming through on that too. Um, and, and a lot of those questions, I think we have already answered in previous sessions. So happy to point in the direction of some of the FAQs, which gives them you know, a lot more detail than I could potentially give you verbally on over a screen. So we can point you in those directions too. Um, but other than that, I think we're going to close the session off now. Anything that we haven't answered that's not already on FAQs, we will be recording this. The session's recorded. We will pick them up. We'll put them on the FAQs. Don't feel like you're being ignored. You're absolutely not. We want people to get involved. Spread the word. Please do. Please do get people to, to attend. Consultations open till December. Please get involved through those routes. I think that's pretty much it. I think that there is a little, uh, hopefully that, that QR code will work, um, as per my other one didn't. Um, and do get involved. And I'd really just really like to thank the panelists today for their, their contributions. And I'd like to thank you all for coming along and for some really helpful feedback, some really helpful questions. Um, it's really good to be talking to you about this now. Um, and other than that, I would wish you all a really good Thursday, Friday, and a fantastic weekend. And we'll hope to see you next week there are a number of, of other sessions there are some zoom sessions for specific forums there are also some in real life sessions that we're going to be going to as well um, a lot of the team are trying to get to some sessions we'll be at some youth clubs we'll be at some schools we'll be at some places so you can come and say hello and say you know welcome back outside of outside of being locked up in offices and rooms for the last 18 months but other than that have a lovely week take care